I'm very impressed to see Albert's hair. I've been doing all sorts of things to my hair to make it look um, the right colour. And here's Albert looking totally perfect. How does this happen? You know, first I sent you a message half an hour ago. If you want to do it on the phone so you don't have to pull your beautiful dresses, makeup or hair and stay in pyjama, we can do it, but you didn't answer. I'm trying to look like Madame Glamour. Have I succeeded? Absolutely. Welcome everybody. I am Susie Menkes, editor of Vogue International at Condé Nast, and you are listening to my podcast, Creative Conversations. As a journalist reporting on the global fashion industry, I want to take you backstage and give you an insight into my world. Listen to my exclusive conversations with creatives, industry leaders, and those whose voices have some of the greatest impact. I think you might find it interesting and maybe intriguing. In this third episode of Creative Conversations, I am joined remotely by the thoughtful, funny, and profound Albert Elbaz, as he enters a new fashion phase with the Richemont Group. Albert was raised in Israel, where he graduated from Shenkar College, the Tel Aviv School of Fashion and Textiles. I first met Albert in New York in the late 1980s, during his first fashion role, a seven-year span with legendary American designer Jeffrey Bean. Moving to Paris, Albert worked with Guy Laroche before being chosen in 1998 by Pierre Berger to become artistic director for Yves Saint Laurent, Rive Gauche. In October 2000, Albert Elbaz became artistic director of L'Envin until October 2015. During that 14-year-old tenure, he transformed the 125-year-old French house into one of the world's most sought-after luxury labels, strengthening his reputation for creating work loved by women. Since exiting L'Envin, Albert was awarded L'Officier de la Légion d'Honneur in 2016. He's worked on several collaborations, including Italian leather group Todd's and with Frédéric Mal, the French perfumer, with whom he revealed his fragrance, Superstitious, at our 2017 Condé Nast Luxury Conference in Oman. We are all waiting for Albert's new role with the Richemont Group, but right now, let's hear more about Albert from Albert. So, Albert, I've been thinking especially of you in this period when doctors and hospitals are in the forefront of our news. You've talked to me so many times about your fearful fascination of the world of medicine. Do you think you've reacted more violently or perhaps thought more deeply about the new normal of our current lives? Yeah, I think that today, I mean, the normal or the word normal is not really a word that any one of us understand what it means. And I think that we all forgot what it meant. Um, You know, you're talking to an hypochondriac, so I'm fascinated with doctors. I mean, I used to go as a kid with my mother to every existing doctor in the city. So I knew every street in the city by the doctors that were there. Um, all, all my life I sketch with CNN on and it's, I called it always the disaster channel. Today I just have to sketch with the window open, it's the disaster window. So um, it's, it's quite, uh, quite hard and I always wanted to be a doctor. Now I actually want to be a head nurse. I don't want to be a doctor anymore, just a head nurse. I love the idea. It's a devotion, the courage, the expertise. Um, I don't know. I was asking myself why a nurse, and I think it's a little bit more personal. There is much more hugging involved. I think that what we've seen in these last few weeks in all the countries in the world is how wonderful these people are who look after us and try to give us back our health. But I think the For fashion people, this sudden stop for COVID-19 has forced everyone to think about the crazy speed of fashion since the new millennial. What do you think? 
Has our fashion industry, as with so many other creative areas, been offered a severe warning now? Is it a warning saying, slow down? I said it so many times, uh, Susie, that I felt that we fashion people are doing this endless marathon where we run and we lose no calorie. Um, it's always about being bigger and always about being faster and always about being cheaper or much more expensive, but it's this endless marathon. It's also being as loud as, as we can, being loud, being screaming on the screen. And this is what we kind of became. Um, but this is not what we are because we're a fantastic industry or a good industry with a lot of good people. I think that, um, you know, I, I, I don't know what will happen. I don't know how long it will happen. I don't know how much we will remember. You know, I think that we all have a brain that is dealing with post-trauma in different way that after we kind of ignore it and move on. But um, I don't know, I want to compare myself or compare this industry or in fashion to the shipping industry. And if I had to choose a boat between a cruise boat or a speed boat, I will actually choose a fisherman boat, but a digital one, a small one <laughs> that can make a right or left, a small one that can decide to stop. And when you're a small boat, you can also fish or find some goldfish in the ocean. That's the kind of boat I want to be. But it has to be a small digital boat, yes. You know, Albert, I think just hearing to your wise words and knowing that they're part of you, they're not something that's invented, you are one of those rare designers who is really loved by women. We were all so grateful at finding someone who was on our side meaning that your clothes are made to express the spirit of different kinds of character, different kind of body shapes. Do you think that is a clear representation of your attitude? Or am I projecting my thoughts about fashion and your work on you? I think it actually helps me on that one that I'm not exactly size four. Uh, the fact that I'm a little bit bigger than that is... Uh, kind of helped me understand that maybe comfort is the definition of modernity um, before anything else. About love, my mother always uh, taught us that love brings love. And you know, when she was uh, in the hospital and I used to go visit her, she asked me to sketch a big, big uh, sketch for her. And one day she asked me if I can write that love brings love. And I think when you love people, they love you back. When you don't like them, they don't like you either. So that is really the motto of my life. Um, I, I have to say that I was so supported by this industry all these years when I had good moment, when I had less go good moment, when I had horrible moment. They were always next to me. And you know why? Because I was never Albert from Longvin. I was not Albert from Saint Laurent. I was not Albert from whatever, I was just me. And, um, and I never changed, so it's, it's one of those. And with women, I think that there are so many changes, and I'm talking about the last decade, but I'm talking also about the last few years. And from being just like baking bread, they became baking bread, but also bread winner. And I think that this is the changes today, that they can do both. And they are much more pragmatic and they know what they want, they know what they need, and I enjoy working with women. I feel that you and we, we all had a long period. I think it was 14 years for you at Lanvin, wasn't it? And that was such a different era when we're looking back now. It was when designers didn't do three years or maybe two years at a house and then out. You must have got emotionally attached to Lanvin and your vision of this intelligent, smart Parisian woman designer, Jeanne Lanvin and her daughter in the 1920s. Did you feel part of her family? And did that make breaking up even harder to be like a divorce? I think so. it was a little bit uh, beyond divorce. I think that when you divorce uh, a child, I mean, it's harder than divorcing a husband and um or a wife and for me every every dress i've done always felt it's actually my little daughter so when i was out i felt almost like all my kids just left me it was a very bizarre feeling and you know i read somewhere that charlie chaplin was actually 
crying only when it rains because he didn't want to show people his tears. And I remember one day, a few months after I was ousted at Lanvin, I was walking out, it was raining, and I had some rain on my face, some real rain and some real, real rain. And um, I met someone from, from Lanvin, and she told me that there is a leakage of water all over the walls at the house, and they can't stop that leakage. And in my mind, in my crazy imagination, I thought, oh my God, the walls are crying. And, and I thought that I brought, and I felt so close to the house, to the people. They were my family, they were my friend, they were my orchestra. I mean, without them, I'm nothing. And it was a very, very, very strong moment. And I'm not sure how much our industry knows what happened to us designers when we're being pushed one way or another. I mean, you know, after that happened, usually we get a phone call, so where are you going? Or who is going to replace you? And it's almost like, you know, the bed, it's still warm and you're already looking for a replacement. And I remember that I was receiving in New York um, from the fashion group, the superstar of fashion world, and the day after I got the register letter saying that I would be out. And as Heidi Klum said in Project Runway, one day you're in and one day you're out in fashion. So I don't know, I gave my best, I always do. Um, Lanvin stayed like in my heart, in my life. The people of Lanvin, the work I've done there, I think it was one of my best year, also creatively for myself. I always respected Jean Lanvin and I always said that she was maybe one of the smartest designer because she was one of the first women designer that created lifestyle, men, women, perfume, home design, I mean, hats. And, um, you know, they said that karma is a bitch. And you know what? The place where I work now, Richemont, I mean, they bought the building of Lanvin and I thought, that is interesting. That is really not just a coincidence. I wanted actually to go back at this point because I wanted to go back right to the beginning, your beginning, to Casablanca in Morocco where you were born. I don't know how old you were. I believe you were very young when your family moved from there to Israel. But I do remember seeing the occasional Moroccan influence, like thick silk woven belts with swinging fringes. Then there was your life in Israel when you went to the Schenker College in Tel Aviv to study fashion and textiles. And you were just talking there about um, studying in this way. Were you a good student? And was it like the London colleges where the students run wild? Or were you a good boy? I think that I'm, for, I'm a good student, but actually I'm a nerd. When it comes to school, I'm a real nerd. I study and uh, I remember when I came to Shankar College in Israel and they asked to see my note. I mean, the secretary saw my note and she asked me, how come I come to study fashion? And I asked her if you have to be stupid to study fashion. She said, actually, yes. And I don't agree with her. I don't think we are. I think we're doing good to the world. I think we're doing good to women and men. But um, being, I mean, at first I left Morocco when I was eight months. So most of my life I lived in Israel. Then I moved to, to um, New York. But Morocco is a special place. Morocco is a place of, of emotion, of heat, of, of naivety, of, of eyes. I mean, people are looking at each other. There is humbleness, there is modesty. Um, in the end of the day, I mean, being in Morocco, in Tel Aviv, or in, in New York or Paris, I always said that it's like pizza, it tastes the same everywhere you eat it. I mean, a little <laughs> bit more cheese or less cheese, but this is what it is. to remember whether I actually saw you in the background at Jeffrey Bean's studio in New York. Did we see each other? 
He was such an exceptional designer, powerful, independent, proud, original. In fact, rather like you, Albert. Do you think that those seven years there in the 1990s is the foundation of your work and in some ways the character of your design? Absolutely, yes. Mr. Bean is, I cannot even say was, Mr. Bean is my mentor, is my best teacher. He was my boss. He was my, 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 you know, I cannot say he was my, my friend, but he was almost like my adopted father. That's how we worked together. And he was a tough one. He was not an easy men but we had an amazing relationship we sat next to each other and i remember meeting you uh susie i think i was sitting by the receptionist and you came with joyce ma and i asked the assistant of mr bean i said who is that lady and she said she's a very important woman that was you so i think i was so scared to say even hello that i ran to the back but i knew who you were and and that's, that's that, but it was seven years in New York after coming, you know, from Israel. And it was the years of freedom, of being me, of being far, being independent. And being at Jeffrey Bean was maybe one of the best school. I felt I did my MA and my PhD with him. Um, there was so much respect and so much trust uh, between Mr. Bean and I, and somehow today when I think about the word love, and I think that sometimes I feel we're overusing it, like everything it's either luxury or using the word love. So love and luxury are overdose, overdose used. So I prefer today trust and respect. And there were plenty of it with Mr. Bean. It's interesting to me how you moved um, in spirit and actually literally from New York to Paris. That was, I think, 1996. And you were pret a porter designer for Guy La Roche. And, uh, you know, I don't remember that much about it. Was it inspirational? Was it exciting for you? Or was it more about elbowing your way, very politely, being accepted into French fashion? I was, it was an interesting, I mean, time because I was moving from backstage from Mr. Bean to dance on the center of the stage where the light was. So you move from the dark to the light. I arrived to Paris in August and it was actually a culture shock because I saw nobody in the street. And I asked everybody at the office, I said, where is everybody? And I understood that in August in France, nobody works. But that was something that uh, I realized later and I actually cherished it and loved it. Um, I worked with uh, Ralph Toledano. He was the man who hired me. And he was the man... You know, there are some... Sometime in life, we have those pillar people and people that change our destiny. I mean, one of them was Jeffrey Bean. One of them was Ralph Toledano. One of them was um, Mr. Berger and Mr. Saint Laurent. So they changed my... And also Mrs. Wong, I'll, I'll give her the credit for it. Um, but but uh, it, was, it was a great time. It was not always easy because it was all new, but I felt that French and France really opened their arm to me. They, I was feeling very loved immediately. They first called me American in Paris, which um, that was that. And then they called me Coluche de la Mode, which I checked later on who was Coluche, and I was actually happy that I was compared to it. And I think that three seasons after I worked at, uh, at Guy La Roche, I was already offered the job by Mr. Saint Laurent to come and um, work with them. So it was an interesting moment, really interesting. I have a story, if, if we have a second. I was in New York at Bergdorf. We had a trunk show, and this lady was after me, and she called me Guy, Guy, excuse me, Guy, Guy. And I said to her, uh, I'm not Guy. So she said, so who are you? And I said, I'm Albert. And she said, and where is Guy? I said, he's dead. And she said, oh my God, when did it happen? <laughs> so here, that was Guy Laos. See, plenty of funny moments. I actually always remember the funny moment and I forget the bad ones. Al 
Lambert, let's hear a bit more about your time at Saint Laurent and also what it felt like handing over to Tom Ford after the group that we now know as Caring brought YSL. I had a great time at Saint Laurent. I met Mr. Berger, I met Mr. Saint Laurent I mean, when I was uh, still at, uh, at uh, Guy La Roche and they offered me after I'm done to come and work in the house. And this was a big dream come true. I mean, since I was a kid, that was that. So two years or almost two years um, was exceptionally, I mean, amazing and hard at the same time. I was a little bit the son-in-law, the one that they all love, but they always like put like next to the kitchen because I was new in, in, in that club and it was a club. And it was a beautiful club. It was a beautiful traditional club. And um, later on, when uh, Caring, uh, Tom Ford um, decided to take over, I mean, I had to go. And Mr. Berger had a nice uh, way to uh, explain it. He said they bought a Ferrari and they want to drive it. I have to say something, Albert, that I did not give you a great review for the first show you did for Saint Laurent. I sort of couldn't understand why everything seemed so imperfect and Saint Laurent was always so totally perfect. And then, of course, slowly uh, this dim little Susie realised that that was the whole point. That's what you wanted to do, break it up. Am I right? Totally. And, and you know, Susie, I mean, perfection always scares me. Those kind of people that you ask them, oh, how are you? And they're like, oh, oh we are fabulous. Life is so good. I mean, these are the people who scares me the most, not because of jealousy, because I know that if there is such a perfection, there is no this contradiction that create electricity, there is no life. So for me, I mean, getting into the house, there was such a perfection everywhere. I mean, everything was perfect. The secretary was perfect. The driver was handsome. The dogs were barking, but elegantly. Everything was beautiful, and but I was missing the unperfect. So I think that the first thing I've done is is changing the cast and then going back to um, the archive and seeing what Mr. Saint Laurent did. And I understood that it's something that I had to do. And I didn't come as a stylist. I came as a designer. So it was not about taking the jacket from 1970 with the shirt from 1983 and said, oh, fabulous, fabulous. No, not at all. I had to design. I had to understand Saint Laurent. I had to understand his vision, his mind. I had to enter his brain in order for me to continue it and to make it relevant again to another generation. And I think that imperfection was my trip as making it more relevant to a new generation. Well, of course, now I understand it all. But um, at the time, I gave you a very iffy review and I didn't understand where you were going. I will never forget it. I thought, what a terrible woman. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was really uh, devastated from this review. And I thought... Uh, I'm thinking today even the system of judging 20 collections a day for, for you, the editors, for the writers, seven days a week for four weeks all around the world without the ability to digest, without the time to actually take and think about it. I mean, writing the reviews in the car at midnight or during the show today, because I mean, every, every editor is like pushing everyone uh, to send it as fast as possible. And, you know, Susie, I mean, the last four years I was judging many projects of students. And at one point I decided not to come and judge anymore. I didn't want to judge. And every school that asked me to come for judging those projects, I said that I will just come a month before the project and I will come to help a month before so I can not judge them. Because when there is a judge, there is also a criminal. And we're not. We're just trying our best. We're trying. We're just antenna, sensitive antenna, and we do what we can and what we know. So those kind of reviews, those kind of moments are always painful. But I think that my yoga teacher told me once that we, what her best teacher actually in yoga was the one who taught her how to fall. 
And I think that is the same with, with reviews. You know, I read the reviews. When it's a good review, I never read it. But when it's a bad review, it's there, there is one bad sentence. I mean, I think I'm, I'm, I'm stopping eating for like 24 hours. So that's a good way to diet. I'm sorry to hear that you didn't read my good reviews because there were plenty <laughs> of them. So um, I don't think I feel, of course, very guilty that I reduced you to tears. But in a way, I think I get criticism and it helps you to go forward. I think you are an excellent teacher in an admirable way. You know, I've seen you, I watched you at London Central St. Martins helping the students. And I never heard someone destroy an outfit in such a sweet and gentle way. It's really helpful when something is no good to say so, but not to kill them off. And how do you think you really can help students? Because they are our future without squashing them flat. Um, I didn't really critique them, but when I saw what they did, I looked at it as a designer and the same eye level. So instead of telling them what is wrong, because there is no right and wrong, what's right for me is not right for them and vice versa. But um, I tried to work with them and show them another alternative and then let them choose what, what is better. The last four years, I did a lot of masterclass in, in different countries, in New York, in London, Germany, Asia. And more than I wanted to teach on those masterclass, I think, actually, I think you came with me one time to uh, St. Martin. Um, and, and more than I wanted to teach them, I wanted to learn from them. I wanted to understand where they are going. Who are they? We, what is that new generation that everybody is saying, you know, we have to have a CEO that is 30 years old and we want a designer that is 17 years old. So I wanted to understand those, that generation, what is so amazing about it. And I found out that they are a beautiful generation. They are beautiful inside out. They don't eat junk food like I do. So they are also like looking good and, and they are good people with plenty of, of ideology. But I think that the biggest issue is that they are exposed to so much information that they, there is not enough place in the brain to dream because it's a lot of data, a lot of information. And um, I think that it's, it's um, the whole thing with what we do, that we have to take the data, we have to take the information, we have to take the research but I always say that our job is being a little bit of a criminal because we have to take it and we have to erase the evidence and move on and change it. We cannot do just an appropriation by being a DJ and mixing A and B and make it yourself. So this is where I'm trying to, actually when I work with students, I want to see this alchemistry. I want to see that one and one equal five and not three or two. brought the brand back to life when you joined Lanvin and lasted there for 14 years. By 2007, you were chosen by Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. What do you think you achieved in those Lanvin years? You know, before I started, the question I asked uh, the, the woman at the time, I mean, uh, is what would you like me to do? What is your vision? What is your dream? And she said to me, wake up the sleeping beauty. So I had a mission and I thought it was a rather interesting mission because it was not about, I wanted to be a billion dollar company, but it was a bit of a fairy tale, wake up the sleeping beauty. And I think that that was the mission. And I woke her up till she became kind of uh, neurotic and crazy because she was running all over the place. I talk about the L'Enfant lady, of course, and I think that when I enter, I said that I want to work with people I love. I want to work with people um, I, I enjoy, that I can learn. I want to do things for women I love. And I want to do for things that I personally love. Because we designers, I mean, many of my colleagues tells me the same thing. They said everything they hate is a bestseller. 
So somehow I said, I don't want to do things I don't like. I want to do things I love. And that was the whole, the whole mission. That's the whole time. And I think for me, the, the definition of, of modernity today, more than anything, is, is comfort and beauty. These are two things that you cannot do some sort of interpretation. Whatever is comfortable or beautiful, I mean, it is. And that's what I try to bring. We created a family. We created, I mean, I, I believe a beautiful music. I felt more like a conductor and they were my orchestra. I couldn't do it without them. And it was a beautiful time. It was the time of freedom, the time of experimental, time of joy, of trying every day. And to tell you that it was always easy now, but what is easy? The other thing is that we didn't have those budget, that endless budget that I wish we could have. But more and more I'm learning that when you have a lot of budget, all you have to do is buy. But when you don't have the budget, you have to create that dream. And even though it's difficult in the end, I find it kind of worth it. So it was a beautiful years. Beautiful. Albert, it was a beautiful period. And I don't want to take you through your breakup with your Taiwanese backer. Divorces can be just as painful in professional work as in personal life. Is there anything you want to say about it? Or do you just want me to shut the door on it? I would say that the biggest compliment was not that you dressed Meryl Streep and so many other celebrities, but in your time at Lanvin, you made so many ordinary women feel special. You know, I love women. So what, what do I have to say? I think that one day I will write a book and I will call it maybe um, War and Peace. Um, but not yet. I think that there were so many things I wanted to say and I didn't, and I always had to hold myself. And I said to myself, Albert, you always did elegant product and elegant dresses, and you love elegancy, so don't open your mouth, don't say anything, let them all say everything they want about you. And I remain quiet, and I'm not sorry about it. I think it was an elegant act for me, and I'm proud of myself that I didn't speak. And now we are waiting with bated breath for your new role to be launched by the Richemont Group. I know you don't want to talk about it now, and I know why. Because you are suspicious, which just happens to be the name of the fragrance you crested with the Prince of Perfumes, Frédéric May. What does Albert smell like? I think the perfume name was superstitious. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> Um, well, I'm superstitious. I'm very, very superstitious. And I think that at Richmond, the, the first few times I met them, they said that at Richmond, we speak about things we've done and not things we're going to do. So I respect that um, philosophy. I like it. I think that we're all so loud everywhere that maybe whispering or just being silent is not too bad, especially to me that I'm a talking lover. So... Um, here I am at Richmond and I'm, it's a new chapter in my life. I'm, I'm, I'm not working, you know, in, in, in a house that I have to replace someone's philosophy and someone's um, aesthetics. I can do things that I believe are relevant. And today I really like the word relevant more than fashionable. So to be relevant, to be relevant to the world of today, to be relevant... To, to the coronavirus that we're living and terrified by. What do we do as designers? How do we take it forward? How do we take it to a place that everything we, will, that we will be doing will have a why? And I'm very, very thankful to Mr. Rupert that gave me the chance to be me. And after three hours meeting, he said, Albert, we go. And I asked him, Mr. Rupert, what would you like me to do? And he said, bring me some fun. And I think that joy is also something that will be great to inject again to fashion, to have people that come to work, especially my colleague designers, that we're all talking to each other and everybody's like, God, it's so stressful. So many collections, so much pre-collection. So here, 
I think that what I want to do is not to continue to do what I had done, but to try to bring another air to, um, to, to the fashion way that I believe. And, and I think that in one of the articles, somebody said, oh, there is going to be a disruptor. And, uh, and I'm not. It's not my style. I'm more like Frank Sinatra. I do it my way. You do indeed. And I can see that in a way you must be relishing the idea of being a startup. For so many of your colleagues, it, it can't be the same thing because they are wondering when they're going to have to start again the crazy speed. Your whole idea of what you're going to do now is, is different, isn't it? It's much more, I wouldn't say low key, but it's not the big dramatic things that you and others have gone through for so many years in terms of producing masses of collections. It's going to be something perhaps more discreet, but certainly something different. You know, for sure it will be, I will try to make it different. I will try, I hope I will succeed. I don't want to like uh, talk too much and then do less, but I, I want to do something that has a meaning also for me and for women around. I think that we've been working for so long where all we wanted is to create things that photograph well. We wanted to have this impressive, I mean, moment in the fashion show. And then when I used to go to stores, I see what is it that they bought? I mean, they didn't buy the exceptional pieces. They bought rather the more commercial. But you see, it was about creating a big propaganda to sell a bag. And I think that maybe I want to go back to textile. And I want to bring back that to the woman. And I want to start thinking about needs and what they want to do and how. So this is what I'm trying to do. And, and I think that everything I want to do has to have a reason. Why am I doing it? This is the change. It's not just collection, pre-collection, post-collection, summer, winter, because defined seasons. I also see, Albert, that you're also thinking about what is going on around us and that you've um, donated one of your sketches to, to a good cause, to a charity auction which is organised by Laurence Benaim, the um, very fine um, French journalist. And it's the idea to be able to buy the um, protective equipment and also to improve things in the um, retire homes. Would that, is that something that you really feel that the fashion industry has done for good. I feel that it's surprising for me to find that my industry has actually stepped right forward there to try and help in this terribly difficult time. I think that uh, I always say it, I mean, in every occasion, every conference, I love fashion. I love the fashion industry. I love the people from the fashion industry. They are my friends. And I am very proud of the way that we are acting. I'm very proud that so many houses are turning from being houses to factories and they are producing the the uniform and the mask for for the hospitals i think that generosity didn't kill anyone i think that generosity is rather beautiful you know i grew in a house in a family that was not very rich but we always learned that life is about giving and getting you cannot only give and you cannot only get you have to have this harmony between giving back and getting some. So yes, I'm doing, I did it for Laurence, that is also a good friend and not only a respected journalist for me. You know, once I know the people, they're not just who they are, but what they are as well. And she's a great person and she did it. And after that, I mean, that was published. And of course, I mean, many people called me back and my issue in life, my problem in life, that I don't really know how to say no. So I say yes to everything. <laughs> so every day I do another, another project, another sketch. I mean, but you know, this is part of life and it's okay. It's great to, to be able to give. Of course, but at the same time, you must have some personal pleasures that come from staying at home. Have you discovered some of those pleasures for yourself? Are you reading books? Are you Instagramming? Are you organizing all those paints and markers that you've always meant to sort out but never had the time? I mean, I know you love sketching. Have you been doing what I might call personal things as well as thinking about your future collection? Yeah, you know I'm hypochondriac, so this uh, timing is not exactly like paradise for hypochondriac. 
Um, so it's, I mean, I started the first week or two weeks. I mean, I couldn't concentrate on any theory. I, I start to read books and I had to read like 10 times every page. And finally, I think it took some time for me to sit down and start to meet myself again. So it was not about going out and having so many meetings or going out and having so many dinners. So I sat home and I start working and it start feeling that your home is a real bunker. You're safe, you're protected. And I started to work and work, endless working and concentrating. And, and I shut the phone I mean, from nine in the morning or eight thirty till six o'clock, and um, at six I start my meeting or my zooms. That so many zoom that you turn into a zombie, <laughs> and um, I find it a very very creative time. And I I was reading this article that they are saying that when we go through a pandemic, I mean, and we go into this catastrophe. Uh, there is always a peak of economics and art, and this is the time to dream. So I know it's a hard time. I know many people lost their loved one, and it's a difficult, scary, terrified. But, you know, every time I went through a difficult time in my life, the only thing that saves me is going to work. Don't look right. Don't look left. Keep walking. Go to the office. Work. And work is my remedy. Work is my antibiotic. I do sometimes dinner, Zoom dinner with my family. I really, more than anything, I really miss hugging people and to be hugged. And I'm not talking virtually. That's my, my thing. And I miss that. I want to kiss everyone. I want to hug everyone. I mean, thank God I'm not living in America. You see, I hug everyone. Um, but here I am. But Albert, I, I must stop you here for a moment and make my last question on comment to be something when you really shocked me, not by the brilliant part you played in my Susie book at our last CNI conference in South Africa, but by something you said. You asked some questions that mostly only my family say to me. You asked this question, do you work too hard? And I'd like to give you an answer now. I don't think I do, because just as you were talking about, I believe in work, I believe in seeing your friends and family, and I always have time for my dear family and for the people I love and respect and admire. But maybe when they open the lockdown, I won't go to what we in the United Kingdom call the opening of an envelope. You know, I know your sons and, and we spoke so many times in different events and I know that they all think that you're the best mother. I know a few of your grandchildren and they think that you are the best grandma. So you give the time and I think that you manage to give the time to your family, to your colleague, to your friends and you're running all over and this is it. And, and I'm sorry I couldn't come to South Africa. It was just the time of negotiation. I had, so I couldn't make your invitation. I would love it. And I thank you very much for, for asking me to do that sketch, the Mona Lisa sketch. I'll talk about it in a second. But, you know, from, from us designers that were, we all know you, Susie, for so many years, and we know that part of you is or was, and I'm sure will be, being a humble journalist, a true journalist that goes not only to the big and famous, but go to small designers at eight in the morning at Brooklyn at 11 o'clock. If you have to be in a dinner somewhere, you always respect people in the industry. And I think this is part of always who, who you were. Um, when I had to do the sketch, when you asked me to do the sketch, I thought of Mona Lisa, the lady who sees everybody and sees it all. But next to Mona Lisa, I put also the humble Susie, the Susie that is running all over and taking notes all over, which is the part I think that people don't always know how hard you, you, you have been working. I remember one time over dinner, I asked you, what do you have for breakfast <laughs> that you have so much energy? Um, and, and going back to the talk that you did with me and 
and you asked me to to do an interview and I was actually su- surprised in honor because I mean you could have chose so many better people than me I mean my English is broken and I'm not a writer but I asked what was in my heart I didn't want to go through Google and check all this Wikipedia and go through and I had I wanted to ask you question like I will ask my sister or someone I love how do you deal with 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 so much how do you deal with a world that is so visual and i remember that you said to me that it doesn't matter how much you write but even if it's one word but it's the right word because we are going as we all know into a visual visual but i believe that you know like fashion it goes from long to short overnight and from lady like to deconstruction over an hour and i think that with so much visual where that we are bombarded with that is so bulimic i do believe in storytelling and i do believe in living story i believe that we have to go back to the world we have to go back to different way of of communicating as well and it's not about writing about a skirt but it's about writing about the why did he do this this skirt why do we do this project how does it become part of of changes that are social changes and i think that you have it because you are our supreme court judge enough about me the only person <laughs> i feel sorry for in all this is mona lisa when she looked at her face as my face and she's a bit tubby a little bit fat round the um, stomach mona lisa must have thought oh my gosh time i went on a diet no we can just add some silicone next time i'll do some puffy lips some silicone I mean, you know, a la mode. But, you know, <laughs> you're talking to a chubby one, so... <laughs> I have zero problem with that, you know? It's in beautiful inside and beautiful outside that are equal for me. Albert, thank you so much for talking to me. I feel honoured and privileged that you should open up in this way. Good luck with your next episode. shows and next events i can't wait for them thank you very much so nice to uh, speak with you and such a nice moment to share some thoughts and some some feelings thank you albert it's lovely to speak to you albert Thank you so much for spending this time with us. How interesting to hear about your time at the right hand of the exceptional Jeffrey Bean and hearing what you were proudest to have achieved during all those years at Lanvin. Thank you very much for joining us for our third episode. I do hope you've enjoyed and perhaps feel inspired to have a creative conversation of your own. During this difficult time, we are continually thankful to all the healthcare and care workers around the world and the many in our industry who continue to work together to help protect our doctors, nurses and frontline workers in the fight against COVID-19. I'm sure you will all join me as we thank them for their continued work. That is all for this episode, but please do come back and join me next week when I'll be in conversation with Balmain's Olivier Roustang. Until next week, on behalf of Condé Nast, I would like to wish you all, and Albert and his team, a safe and healthy week ahead. If you would like to find out more about our conference, please do visit cniluxury.com. To find my articles, visit the fashion channel of vogue.co.uk and at Susie Menke's Vogue on Instagram. If you have enjoyed the podcast, then please do rate, review, subscribe, and tell your friends. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, TuneIn, Stitcher, YouTube, and many others. Support for Creative Conversations podcast comes from the Condé Nast Luxury Conference. Creative Conversations with Susie Menkes is produced by Natasha Cowan and edited by Tim Thornton. Music by Jörg Zuber, graphics by Paul Wallace, and production assistance by Lauren Sweeting.